again, thank you all for coming to my master's thesis defense. Um, so there's a number of different uh, factors that went into the success of this project. So the evolutionary paleoecology lab here at Cal State Fullerton, obviously the Department of Geology here, um, the Cooper Center, uh, Geological Society of America grant, as well as the KPPL here on campus. So just a little overview of what I'm going to be talking about in my project today. So I'm going to give you a little background um, and talk about why I'm doing this project and talk about the importance of this project. Then I'll go into my hypotheses and research goals and then discuss my methods to test these hypotheses. And then I will talk about my results and interpret them and then give you a little conclusion about the uh, overall project and then go into my acknowledgments. So the first thing I want to talk about is why oysters are important and why we should care about them. So oysters are really important because they are filter feeders. So they actually take in phytoplankton, remove it from the water, um, eventually deposit their waste into the soil and bury it down. So what this does is actually clears the water um, and allows more sunlight to come through, which is helpful for any kind of marine plant to be successful. Um, these marine plants are very important nursery locations for a lot of marine animals, so um, oysters help aid in that as well. They also provide a hard substrate for other organisms to attach to. Um, oysters cement using their left valve and so they build reefs on top of each other and this allows for other organisms to attach to it um, and build as well. <coughs> Another thing they do is they reduce sediment resuspension and so they um, allow for the uh, muddy, looser sediment to be a little bit um, more compacted and so it doesn't allow for much uh, sediment to be resuspended. They also provide a natural breakwater along our coast so that helps um, with coastal, helps from the coast for, from being eroded. <coughs> All of this leads to improved water quality. This is why they're very important to us. An adult oyster can actually filter up to 48 gallons of water a day so you can see in large numbers that these oysters um, provide a much clearer water for us and much um, more improved water quality. They also help bring in more organisms, so greater biodiversity along our coast. And here's the image just showing you before and after these oysters filter the water. So you can tell really murky water here and after it's much clearer. So they definitely are really important off our coast. Another reason why they're important is because their food chain is very fragile. And so if you remove an element from the food chain, for example, oysters, if they go extinct or they're no longer in our coastal environment, then that has devastating effects on things that eat those oysters. So for example, in this picture, the octopus feeds off of oysters. So if we lose our oysters, we can lose the octopus as well. And then the things that eat the octopus, such as these large fish or sharks, those can leave as well or go extinct if we don't have oysters in our environment. So all of this leads up to why we're doing this project. So oysters are declining along our coast. We have one native species of oyster, which is Austria lurida. Um, its historical range once stretched from Sitka, Alaska down into Baja, California. But now, the modern West Coast geographic range, very sporadic. We don't see it as much along our coast anymore. Oyster reefs along the eastern coast began going extinct and now the western coast is following the same trend. So you can see natural oyster reefs along our coast are basically functionally extinct at this point or they're very poor reef conditions. So why are these oysters declining? And there's a number of factors that contribute to this. First of all, obviously humans play a big role in this. Um, the first humans to settle in North America would be the Clovis. They settled here around 11,000 BC, eventually migrating towards the west coast. 
um, they would set up their villages along the coast and eventually their diet changed from a terrestrial diet to a more marine diet. And so they would actually set up uh, their villages right next to these oyster reef populations. Um, and then around the six, mid 16th century, we start seeing our Southern California tribes coming in like the Chumash and the Gabrielino. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint when Native Americans first entered into California because the sea level has risen 120 meters since the last glacial maximum, which actually erases a lot of evidence of Native Americans here. Um, we can analyze these shell middens um, to see what, what these Native Americans are eating when they arrived here um, and what roles they played along the coast as they were here. Um, another factor that contributes to oysters declining Again, human consumption, so many people eat oysters, so that also plays a role in their decline. Another reason why they're declining is waste from sulfite paper mills. So a lot of this waste um, is solid waste, contains alcohol or other chemicals and things like that. Some of this will be directly dumped into ocean waters or into rivers that eventually flow into bays and ocean. And so a lot of this waste contributes to um, lower or more mortality within our oyster communities. Um, and so that plays a really important role in their decline. And then another big factor would be urban waste. So um, a lot of the runoff that we get from storms go into these storm drains, taking in any of the stuff that's along our roads or any urban pollution dumping into the storm drains, which eventually go into, for example, San Diego Creek. So this water and urban runoff from the storm drains will empty to the creek. It's all untreated. Eventually that creek flows into Newport Bay, dumping all of that waste into the bay, which <laughs> is really detrimental to any kind of marine organisms that live in the bay. Um, one of the big factors within California that oysters are declining is dredging of the bay. And so any kind of bays that we have, they dredge so that boats can get in and out. Um, this dredging removes a lot of sediment and hard substrate for oysters to attach to. So without a hard substrate, they're not attaching or building these reef structures that they did in the past. And so um, another thing that happens is as they're dredging, these oyster reefs that were possibly there also get destroyed along the way. So this leads us to the present restoration that's occurring for the Olympia oyster or Austria lirida off our coast. So Dr. Zachrel within the biology department is working to restore our only native species of oyster back to its original bay environment. And so um, Newport Bay is the site of one of their restoration efforts. So what they do is um, because of dredging, there isn't a hard substrate for the oyster spawn to attach to or larvae to attach to. So they put these bags of oyster shells down on the surface and then eventually, hopefully, they're hoping that the larva will start attaching to these shells. And they actually see it occurring very quickly once they put a hard substrate down, they start seeing the attachment very quickly. And then once we start building these reef communities back up again, we start seeing other organisms coming back in thus increasing the biodiversity within the area. And so, um, like I said, they're doing a restoration in Newport Bay, and then they're also doing some other ones along the coast. So it leads us to our project setting. So because of all these factors and oysters uh, declining, uh, we wanna look at a historical look of oysters. So this is a two-part study. The first part of this project um, involves collecting fossil uh, or s oysters from fossilized oyster reefs within Newport Bay. Um, Newport Bay is a great locality for this. First of all, because it has two distinctive fossil oyster reefs that flank each side of the bay. Um, and the second reason is because this is where they're doing the oyster restoration project. So these fossilized oyster reefs can give us a close look at how oysters have changed through time. It's our closest link to the modern reef structures that they see. 
The second part of this study involves looking at curated oyster specimens um, that are located at the Cooper Center. Um, these little dots here are all GPS localities of specimens that were collected um, and now are housed at the Cooper Center. <coughs> and then it also shows surficial geology of Orange County as well. So now going into my hypotheses and research goals. Um, so the main research goal for this project is to give a deep time look at oysters through time and how they've changed. We want to look at how oyster structures were successful in the past before we had any kind of human interaction um, and then uh, study them through time. And so looking at the last 70 million years of oyster history. So I hypothesize that oyster diversity and abundance decrease through time. So we see a decline in diversity and abundance. Um, and then my other hypothesis is, that, hypothesis is that ecological diversity and abundance decrease through time. So past oyster communities, diversity and abundance will decrease through time. And then we also looked at oyster size through time. Size is very important to look at because it can play a role in their success or demise. So we want to look at if size played any kind of role in their decline. So I hypothesize that oyster size decreased through time as well. Um, this figure here is a stratigraphic column showing where we have data for strat stratigraphically. So we do have data from the late Cretaceous. So again, giving us our 70 million years of time. Unfortunately, not all the specimens at the Cooper Center have been curated yet. So we do see a gap in time as far as diversity and abundance data goes. Um, but we are able to look at oyster size for the late Cretaceous, Eocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and the Holocene. So that gives us a pretty large range of data. Going into methods now, so I'll first talk about the first part of our project, which is the Newport Bay study. So we collected samples in Newport Bay on each side of the bay, the east and the west, um, laterally across. So on the east side of the bay, this is where the samples were collected, about one meter apart. Um, west side of the bay, this is where you can see the oyster samples being collected. We collected 10 bulk samples um, and placed them in Ziploc bags. And then those bulk, bulk samples were taken back to the lab where they were analyzed and identified to the genus or species level. So this is showing you, we also collected shells to date for carbon-14 dating. Um, we collected them at the base, middle, and top of our oyster reefs. Um, this was so that we could see that the oyster reefs on each side of the bay, if they were the same stratigraphic age, which is what we believed when we went out there. And so these samples were collected. This is the East Bay samples and the West Bay samples. And then there's also a charcoal layer that drapes over both of these um, fossilized oyster reefs. So we also wanted to date the charcoal to also confirm that these two reefs are the same stratigraphic age. So um, charcoal samples were collected from each side of the bay. Um, they were prepared in the KPPL lab here at Cal State Fullerton. Um, using a sonicator to separate the sediment from the charcoal. Then once the sediment and charcoal was separated, I um, sieved the charcoal out, then it was dried in the oven, and then Dr. Kirby picked the samples that were sent to the Keck laboratory to be carbon-14 dated. The same um, preparation went for the oyster shells as well. The only difference was once the oyster shells were separated from the sediment, um, after they were dried, I used a hand grinder to grind them up into a powder to give us a more precise age. <coughs> I also did an ecological analysis on um, all the organisms that were found within our reef samples, our fossilized oyster reef samples in Newport Bay. And so I looked at their different ecological niches um, and how those played a role into the reef structure. On to the second part of the study, so our curated specimen study at the Cooper Center. 
So specimen collections were identified um, taxonomically and so um, went through the warehouse, tried to find all the oysters that they've had curated and then once those were located, um, they were identified um, using various papers. I also went down to the San Diego Natural <coughs> History Museum to look at their collection to compare it with the Cooper Center collection. Um, also used the Treaties of Invertebrate Paleontology to identify as well as various papers and other f images as well. So we also did measurements, again, to look at how sizes change through time. Um, so all the measurements were taken from the same place on each oyster shell. So our um, length measurements were taken, venter to dorsum, so top to bottom. Um, our thickness was taken from the base of the hinge structure to the top of the thickest part of the hinge structure. And then our width measurements were taken from posterior to anterior side, so side to side. Um, there were times where I wasn't able to measure specific parts like venter to dorsum, say the base of the shell was broken. I didn't measure it because it wouldn't have been an accurate measurement. Now getting into the statistics, so a number of different statistical processes were used to analyze the data. Um, for time constraint, I'm going to talk about the ones that were most important to our study. So we use a principal component analysis to look at abundance and size through time. So these PCA plots, um, the axes are unitless, so they don't really have a numerical measure to it. So how you want to look at this is um, looking at it as distance. So something that's closer together is more similar. Something that's further apart is more different. So the first thing you have to do is figure out what each axis represents in your data. So for example, if I'm looking at size data, does the bottom axis represent the length or width, or does it represent thickness? And does the y-axis represent thickness or length and width? Um, and then once you figure out what your axes represent, then you start looking at the data and what plots closer together. So something like this is very statistically, well not statistically similar, but very similar as far as their um, comparisons go. Um, and then so on and so forth. These are very similar because they plot close together. These are very similar because they plot close together. Those are very similar because they plot close together. Then you look at these compared to these, or these compared to these are very close together, so you could say those are very similar. And these plot pretty far apart, so they're pretty different, and as well as these. They plot pretty far apart, so they're very different as well. So there's no statistical significance because we're not dealing with numbers with this. Um, what it's doing is just giving us a visual perspective of how similar or different things are. Uh, the other statistical approach we did was using linear regression lines. And so what happens is we choose our axes. So for example, length and width here. We want to compare, um, see if there's a correlation between the length and width measurements. And so what you do is you get all your data plotted and then a regression line or best fit line is plotted through your data. Um, and then you get an R squared value. Um, so a higher R square value, so something closer to one, <coughs> represents more correlation in your data. Um, a lower R squared value, so something around 0.5 or less, represents less correlation in your data. So this R squared value is 0.84, which means 84% of your data plots along your regression line. So it's a pretty strong correlation between those two. So now getting into my results and interpretations. So we'll for, first look at our Newport Bay study. So in Newport Bay, um, I identified only one species of oyster, which was Austria lurida. These are the dates that came back for our charcoal and our shells. Um, so our shell dates came back pretty close together, so that um, 
fits with our idea that these two sides were stratigraphically um, the same age. And then our charcoal layers actually came back exactly the same age. So that means that both of these fossil oyster reefs were affected by the same fire event. Um, our ecological analyses of our Newport Bay data, we had um, four different species or genera present. Um, our argopectin, our epifaunal suspension feeders. So again, they attach to this hard substrate um, and they also um, feed suspensionally like our oysters do. Our Carpidula fornicata, so these are limpets. Um, they're pretty free floating. They don't really necessarily have to attach anything, but they can attach or they, they can be found in these reef structures. Um, our Keone californiensis um, is an infaunal, meaning it buries itself in the sediment. And then again, Osteolurida is epifaunal, so it attaches to the substrate. And it's also filter feeding. All right, so going into our museum part of our research, so our curated specimen study at the Cooper Center. So um, going through our stratigraphic age here, we'll look at the late Cretaceous first. So I found four different species or genera of oysters. Um, within our late Cretaceous. So these would be Texagraphia, Austria prudentia, Acute Austria, and Austria indigena. Moving into our Eocene, we see three different species or genera of oysters, that being Austria Tayleriana, Austria Helleli, and Austria Frudenbergi. Uh, moving into our Miocene, we still see the presence of Austria Frudenbergi and Austria Hawelli, but now we also see Austria Arisi and Cross Austria Titan. Our Pliocene, I only um, identified one species, which was Austria Wadii. Pleistocene, we see two different species. That's when we first see our first appearance of Austria Lerida. We also see Austria Megadon present there. And then including our Newport data into this for the Holocene, we have one species of oyster in the Holocene and that's Austria Lerida. So now looking at oyster abundance and diversity, so we plotted the number of species that we found within these um, different ages. So we have our late Cretaceous, Eocene, and Miocene. All have um, fairly large diversity of oysters. And then once we get into our Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene, we see a decrease in the number of species of oysters. Now looking at the abundance on here, we see a, a higher abundance of oysters within our samples for the Pleistocene and Holocene. Um, and then in our Cretaceous, Eocene, and Pliocene, we see lower abundances of oysters within these communities. So looking at abundance through time, um, so this is a, a cluster plot. And so what we look at here is the groups that pair together. And so right off the bat, we can see two groups two large distinctive groups here. Um, and then we can actually break down this larger group into four smaller groups. So looking at this, we can see that basically all of our late Cretaceous abundance data plots together. Um, and then we get into, um, with the exception of one Pleistocene and one Pliocene locality. Um, then we see that a lot of our Pleistocene data will plot together as well. Then we see our Holocene data. So these two are connected. That means that they pair up or they're very similar. So it's looking at similarities between these groups. Um, and then again, we see our Pleistocene data. So then once we look at this cluster diagram, we compare it to our plot here. And we see that all these groups match up in this plot as well. 
So we see our group five here, which was all our late Cretaceous, except for our Pleistocene and Pliocene. Um, we see our Pleistocene here plotting together. And then we see our abundance of Holocene plotting together here. So adding that information into our plot, um, so we have our late Cretaceous here with a higher abundance ecologically. So now we're looking at these past oyster communities. Um, and then we have a higher abundance here in our Pleistocene. And we see lower abundance values in our Pliocene and Holocene for those. Now adding our diversity into this, um, we see that down here, diversity goes from zero to one. So one being more diverse, zero being less diverse. Our late Cretaceous data um, stays pretty constant and has fairly high diversity. Um, once we get into our Pliocene, um, it, the diversity is a little bit less than our late Cretaceous, um, as well as into our Pleistocene which is a little bit more variance in their diversity than we see in the late Cretaceous. And then going down into the Holocene, so we see a little, little bit of a gradual decrease in diversity there. Now looking at our size data through time, so going back to that PC, or the principal component analysis plots, um, first we had to decide what did these axes represent. So looking at our data, we realized that PC1 represents our length and width. So small to large as you go from left to right. PC2 represents thickness. So thinner on the bottom to thicker oysters towards the top. So once we figured that out, then we could start an analyzing the plots. So we see here our Miocene data plots on the large end. So these are our largest oysters that we see during the Miocene. We also see that our Pliocene plot pretty large as well. And our Eocene plot fairly large. And then our late Cretaceous are large as well. But their size actually varies greatly across. So they do have some smaller oysters. Um, we also see that our thickest oysters are also within these groups as well. So the Miocene the Pliocene and the Eocene. And then our Pleistocene and Holocene um, plot more on the smaller side um, and not as thick, although we see some thicker ones here in the Pleistocene. Now comparing that to our linear regression information. So um, the x-axis here represents ventral to dorsal, which is our length measurement. The posterior to anterior was our width measurement of our oysters. So based on our R squared value here, 0.83, 83% of our data fits our regression line here. So it's a really strong correlation between length and width, which means if you're increasing your length, you'll also see an increase in your width as well. Um, another thing to point out is that, again, we see our Miocene plotting on the larger end. Um, we see our late Cretaceous as well, with a little more variance. Um, our Pliocene, again, plots larger. And our uh, Pleistocene and Holocene all plot down here, which means they're much smaller. So it matches our data that we saw here as well. Now comparing thickness to our length and seeing if there's any kind of correlation there, um, our data only had an R squared value of 0 0.60. So only 60% of our data fell on the regression line, which means there's not really a strong correlation between thickness and length. So we don't see an increasing thickness as we have a length increase as well. Um, but again, looking up here, we see really thick Miocene oysters um, and our Pliocene as well and Eocene would all be our thickest oysters, which again matches with our PCA results. So adding all of that information onto our stratigraphic column here, um, we add oyster size here. So the size of the circles represents the size of the oyster. So in the Miocene, we have our largest oysters. In the Eocene, late Cretaceous, 
the Pliocene. Um, we still have fairly large oysters, but they're a little bit smaller than our Miocene ones. And then our Pleistocene and Holocene are the smallest oysters that we see. So what are some of the reasons possibly for this size change? Um, well, we looked um, at some information as far as ocean circulation patterns go. And so it's believed around the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, we see the closing of the Central American Seaway. Um, so we had a lot of warm water flowing in here before. But then once that closes, it changes our ocean circulations drastically. So this caused a large cooling in North America during this time, which can affect the size of oysters as well. Oysters are very, um, they're, when temperature changes, it affects them greatly. So um, <coughs> any kind of temperature change like this can affect a community of oysters very quickly. Um, so kind of comparing this with our ocean temperature ch uh, changes here. So as you can see, it's warmer in the Eocene and the Miocene, and then much cooler as we get into the Pliocene and the Pleistocene. Um, there's actually more nutrients available in cooler water because of, because of upwelling. So that's another factor that can play into oyster size as well. Uh, another reason for a size change can be due to predation. So this is a Miocene oyster here. You can see drill holes that are present. So the presence of um, drilling organisms or any kind of predation can affect sizes of oysters through time. So this is just showing you the appearance of molluscivores. So we have a, a radiation of um, molluscivore or mollusk eating organisms. Um, so shell crushing cephalopods or any kind of shell crushing organisms. Um, these force entry and drilling, those all play a role on oysters because they all feed off of oysters. But what about Cope's rule? Some of you are probably not as familiar with that. So Cope's rule suggests that um, because of the marine or the Mesozoic marine revolution, um, we see an increase in uh, size of organisms through time because of predation. And so our data actually sees the opposite of this and we actually see a decrease in size through time. Um, some suggests that larger organisms are more visible to um, predators. So this could be a reason why they decrease in size through time. Also, um, when you have a larger oyster, larger things require more food. So if you are in, um, if you have a large change in the food availability, that can affect the size of oysters as well. So going into my conclusions, just a reminder of my hypotheses. So oyster diversity and abundance decreased through time. Ecological diversity and abundance, so that's looking at communities through time, have decreased through time. And oyster size has decreased through time. So my first hypothesis, oyster diversity and abundance decreased through time. So looking at our plot here, we see that diversity um, definitely does decrease through time. We start with four to three different species of oysters that we see in our older data. And then once we get to our Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene, we see less species of oyster present. <coughs> um, and then looking at our oyster abundance data, we see actually more abundance in our Pleistocene and Holocene. So we see more oysters present in the communities within our Pleistocene and Holocene and um, less abundance of oysters within our late Cretaceous and our Eocene and our Pliocene. Um, the X's on here represent where we're actually missing data from, where we didn't have data from the Cooper Center. Moving on to the second hypothesis, so ecological diversity and abundance decreased through time. So now looking at our ecological abundance diversity, our abundance um, was pretty high in the late Cretaceous and the Pleistocene, but much lower in the Pliocene and Holocene. 
Um, so it's not a constant um, value for abundance, but we do see a decrease until we get to the Holocene. So the values aren't constant, but it does. we do see a decrease going into the Holocene. Um, and then putting our ecological diversity on there, we see in the late Cretaceous that um, these communities were much more diverse. And then going into the Pliocene, the Pleistocene and the Holocene, we see a decrease in diversity within these communities. And then our last one here, looking at oyster size through time. So I hypothesize that oyster size decreased through time. So we see our largest oysters in the Miocene here. Um, late Cretaceous, Eocene, and Pliocene also were fairly large. And then once we get into the Pleistocene and Holocene, these oysters are much smaller. So we do see a decrease in oyster size through time. So now into my acknowledgement. So I first want to start with Dr. Benuso, um, because she is most important to me, Tier. Um, but thank you for everything you've done for me um, from undergrad to grad school. This is where my pregnancy hormones come in. <laughs> um, I just can't thank you enough for everything and all your guidance and teaching me to be a strong female scientist. Um, also, I want to thank Dr. Kirby for... <laughs> He looks like he's going to kill me right now. <laughs> um, for allowing me to use your lab and also providing financial support so we could date our oyster, or not our oyster shells, but our charcoal as well. And um, thank you so much because without that, you know, we wouldn't have had that information for this project. And also, thank you for being on my committee and giving me feedback for this project and the ideas as well. And Dr. Wood, thank you so much for being on my committee as well and providing me feedback um, for this project too. This is from when we went to Yellowstone. You picked a slightly better. <laughs> I'm looking into this. Stuff. I just want the. I just like the bison in there. <laughs> um, also, thank you to the Cooper crew um, for allowing me to come invade your space over at the Cooper Center um, and helping me locate oysters when I was looking for them and teaching me how to use the database. Um, especially Meredith, you're a big help with a lot of things in this project. So thank you so much to all of you at the Cooper Center. Thank you to Wayne Henderson for always being an ear when I need to talk or if I need to cry or just providing me hours of entertainment. Don't make a joke out <laughs> Please stop talking. <laughs> um, thank you to my field support system. Um, so my husband Bob, who came out with me a few times and played photographer for me. Um, to Carolyn, who came out um, on, the, <laughs> on the day that I didn't check the tides and <laughs> was like wading through the water and trimming bushes with the clippers. And um, you were very helpful in helping me collect my samples. Um, thank you to Beth for coming out and helping me collect my oyster shells that I used to date. And also to Gabe for coming out as well and helping out and taking pictures. Apparently I don't know how to take pictures because everyone else takes pictures from me. Um, Dr. Zachrel, who couldn't be here today, but she played a very vital role in this project um, because we were able to look at her modern data and um, use it to compare our data. And so now she gets to use our data for her modern reef restoration projects. Um, so she was very helpful in also guiding me to certain papers that would help answer some of my questions as well. Um, Paul Demery at the San Diego Natural History Museum, he allowed me to come down there and look through their collection <coughs> so I could use them to identify the oysters from the Cooper Center and from Newport Bay. Um, Geological Society of America provided us with a grant that we were able to use to date our oyster shells in Newport Bay to get a precise age on each of the oyster reefs from each side of the bay. And then last but not least, my family for everything that they've done, although the only one here is my husband, but <laughs> the others wish they could, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for all of your support and 
helping me through tears and uh, and always being there for me. I'm just talking to you now because no one else is here, but um, it's been a long road between undergrad and grad school, so they've definitely been a big support system along the way for me. So that goes into any questions 